Tattersail, how thorough is your exhaustion? <laughs> ATN doesn't want to hear that. 220 years old to his 21. And she's ready. Dirty. Welcome back to Sci Fi and Fantasy Read Along. I'm ATN. I'm DM Phil. And I am Yule. We're really good at this. <laughs> This episode is covering chapter nine. Nine chapters. When we're done, we will be 10 pages shy of halfway. How many chapters are in this? 24. Oh, good. They get shorter. They, yes, they get shorter. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, thank you for joining us. Let's talk about the preamble. Just real quick, because there's we don't glean much from it, if I'm not mistaken. It's just a description of... Onus Tulan. He is the Tulana Moss that is working with the adjunct. Well, for the time being, I don't want to tell too much, you know. I think the coolest part here is that this is a little history blip, and it's written by Talk the Younger, one of the main characters of this chapter. Three days ride north of Pale among the grass sea of the Rivy Plain, Talk the Younger seeks the adjunct. Well, we don't actually know who he's supposed to meet in the beginning. He's just looking for his contact. And the locals that live out in the Rivy Plain, the Rivy people, they're hostile to the Malazans now. So he's in enemy territory. Yeah, he knows because they're a migrant folk. So he knows that they're on the northeast area of the Rivy Plain. They're working like, with Caladan Brood now, who his contact is two days late. So this is some concern. So there are ravens circling in the sky, and this leads Talk the Younger to... A scattering of bodies, 12 in all. Yeah, 12 of them, and eight of them are Malazan Marines. They're elites. They're Jakatakan. And then there's four that are the enemy, and they're Bargast. Just to add it, I, th I think the Bargast are a little bit on the kind of the primitive side. I think they're like barbarians. Yeah, that might be a better description. Barbaric. Okay, so he can sense it somehow. He can sense that magic has been used in this area. And then when he sees the Bargast with his throat cut, he somehow knows that the Bargast was not opposed by magic. Well, the shaman, the unleashing of sorcery had been the shamans, but no magic had opposed him. So that's another thing. There's two things there. One of them right. is the smell. Well, specifically, he said he still had a bad feeling about this. Something hung in the air. Something between a smell and a taste. Right. That's some strange sensory stuff, right? Yeah, and you know, I'm, I'm we, we should pay attention to any time he uh, scratches his eye. I was thinking similarly, yeah. So he learns some stuff here at the site where there are the bodies, but his contact isn't here, so he keeps looking around, finds a trail, and he starts following that. But there's two trails. There's the trail of the people who fled, and then there's the trail of the moccasin people who were following. Talk expects to be discovered by the bar gas. He doesn't think he can sneak up on the bar gas. He knows he's going to get pin cushioned. Maybe he can take a couple of them out before he dies. Oh, well, and then he just goes. Kind of resigned to his fate, right? He gave the wide red scar crossing his face a vigorous, painful scratch, realizing that the maddening itch would return in moments anyway. And then he says, oh, well, and it's, it's you know, I, I thought about this also. Is he saying, oh, well, being resigned to his fate or just understanding that even though he scratched at his wound, it was going to scratch, you know, it was going to itch again. Both of those you know, things are being resigned to his fate. Yeah, it's just, it's, I like that. They kind of run in parallel, right? Right. You don't have to read into either or, but they're probably both the same thing. Yeah, he seems pretty zen. <laughs> Is that why you like him? I do. Yeah, I think talk's pretty sweet. I do too. I really do like him. I don't I don't know about the the fatalism of this being an an admirable trait, but I do like the guy. Pursued and outnumbered, adjunct Lorne and two Jakatakan make their stand at a barrow rising from the plain. So now we're with Lorne, adjunct Lorne, who is Talk's contact, who's two days late, has been attacked. I think one of her Jakarta Khan elites is wounded. The other one is not. They're weary as all hell. And they find this barrow rising out of the plain with these large monolithic stones circling it. And she orders, one, she orders the crossbow man on top of the barrow. And, well, I don't really know that there's any reason to talk about the battle. Nobody's going to miss anything from that battle, and except maybe at the very, very end, there might be a little bit of confusion when she's on the ground. She dislocates her short sword arm and drops her sword, and she's basically defenseless, and then she's about to die. She's dead. She's right? doomed. 
and you see this skeletal hand come up out of the ground and grab a hold of this bargast's ankle, like I guess mid calf like, is kind of what they, I imagine it, and just like crush it with his hands. And this is a big person, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. They're they're like a head taller than humans. Yes, the amount of effort required to break a leg bone with one hand, and then you see this flint sword comes up out of the ground and just like impales this bargast from in the you know. He from, can't get away. It's from nuts to neck. It's incredible. Kind of visceral. Makes you cringe. Makes me cringe anyway. Talk the younger comes in though at the end and you know, he shoots some of the bar guests down also. Yeah, like when when Lauren gets up with her well, I don't even know if she gets up off the ground. I don't really remember that. She's she's mad at Tool, the skeletal warrior who just showed up for for not being there when she needed him there. Like, right. where were you? And like talk is kind of freaking out because he's never he's seen them before, but only from a distance. And he's seeing this guy up close for the first time and it's an undead. Like if you think about it, it's a skeletal undead and Lorne is berating it. And I guess it's just kind of shocking to talk. He describes very clearly what he sees. And I don't think we're going to get another really good description of a Talana Moss in the rest of this book. So we should talk about that. The creature that rose from the earth was cloaked in rotting furs and it stir stood over the warrior's body, one leg still clutched in its hand. The other hand gripped a sword, which had been pushed the length of the Bargast's body through its neck. Tok eagerly studied the Talana Moss. 300,000 years had taken their toll. The skin that stretched across the squat man's robust bones was a shiny nut brown in color, the texture of leather. Whatever flesh it had once covered had contracted to thin strips of the consistency of oak roots. Such muscles showed through torn patches here and there. The creature's face, what Tot could see of it, bore a heavy chinless jawbone, high cheeks, and a pronounced brow ridge. And then uh, the eye sockets were dark holes. So we're looking at an undead creature, <laughs> right? Yeah. And Lauren's like, I said, asked you a question. Where were you? And he's like, eh, I was traveling. I was exploring. He's kind of as blase about Lauren's reprimand as sorry is about Kalam's. You're already dead and you're 300,000 years old. What do you care about some stripling? Oh, yeah, no, he's got every reason. 300,000 years. That's triple the age of Crone. That's triple the age of Anamanda Rake. I mean, for not caring, he still is like, I was supposed to be here. I'm here. I did what I'm supposed to do. She doesn't want to hear his history. Like he's giving and offering her his history, how he was wedded as a warrior in the sixth Jagat war and blah, blah, blah. And she's just kind of, yeah, whatever. Anyway, moving on. And so talk and adjunct Lorne, I believe meet now for the first time. So he slings her arm for her. He like cuts some armor off of, or he cuts the woolen undercloth from one of the bar guests' armor and he makes a sling for her. And then he retrieves her auditorial sword for her. Tell me about auditorial. Auditorial. It's a, an ore that's mined. I don't remember where it's from. It's north on the same peninsula or um, continent as Seven Cities. And it has a magical property of resisting magic or actually destroying it. Yeah, like absorbs it or something. So in a sword, it's all that much more deadly. We assume, I don't think it was actually stated, but this is obviously the sword that killed the shaman earlier. Oh, it would be nice just to have a charm of that stuff around your neck, you know? But yeah, she has an auditorial sword, which apparently is rare, and she doesn't want word of that sword and its effect efficacy getting around out here. She says the people of Seven Cities, they know all about it, but out here, nobody knows about it. Yeah, and it's at that moment where Tok looks at Onus Tulin and Lorne responds that she doesn't think that the Odatoral Sword would destroy uh, one of his people. She's definitive about it. Yeah. She says it's been tried. But why? They've tried to use Odatoral on the Talana Moss and it doesn't work. And it has something to do with the Warrens being of unrelated, different kinds, older, working with blood. Possibly like a more primitive version of magic. Maybe like, I don't know where the wellspring of it comes from, maybe. Yeah, that's tough <laughs> call. Something like that. We just don't know enough. Like we need all 10 books under our belts to really talk about this stuff with, you know, any certainty. Sure. And we just don't have it right now. It's all kind of a mystery. When he introduces himself by name, she's like, oh, I knew your father. She presumed he was dead and then talk suggests that that might not be the case. 
and then she's all, all right he disappeared <laughs> ever since the emperor died the only thing i think really is in this section is onus tulan he just is like the barrow has provided a truth that's right as they're about to leave yeah talk wants to give the the horse up only to her and then he'll catch up she says she would rather be a little bit late and prepared which speaks to the efficiency that the claw are sort of famous for so nothing about that barrow listen it's important because to, uh, onos says we are on the right path and he's concerned you know specifically talking about the barrow and it's that time and you know talk is realizing what's going on they're kind of like talking about something you know that he doesn't know anything about and it's that the time when his eye that he doesn't have the wound is starting to you know itch and he starts to scratch it again and that's yeah. when uh lauren turns around and is like something bothering you he's all no it's just my eye well he yeah. cursed under his breath right yeah and it's a little murmur, yeah. He thought about his response carefully and then deflected her question, I think is what he did. Yeah, he did it really coy. He's like, oh, no, this is just the price of being blind. Which is probably a good answer when you're dealing with Lorne. I wouldn't want to make her angry. I mean, she's the right hand of the Empress, after all. Right. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. a dangerous lady. He spends some real close personal time with her. He's going to, yeah. <laughs> Sharing that horse. For three or four days... Rising from six days of unconsciousness, Tattersail and Perrin finally meet. We're in Tattersail's quarters, and she's been unconscious for days, and Perrin has been charged with her care. But in reality, it was supposed to be the other way around. Like, they had brought him in almost dead, and she was supposed to care for him, but then the dog attacked, the hound attacked, and now the roles have been reversed. Okay, so she's abed unconscious and Perrin is just kind of wandering around pacing and thinking about his memory and his recent past and like he's been dead Perrin has been dead recently and he's starting to lose all of his memories it's getting vague and and we're kind of left with the we don't have a clear understanding of what he actually remembers right he said that all the strength had poured from his body he remembers that and then he remembered a hazy vision of a massive dog a hound right you know he's just kind of put, trying to put the pieces back together like you said i wonder if it's getting harder to do though you know like he's had days to think about it and i don't think it's getting clearer i wonder if it's getting less clear i feel like like when you have a memory <laughs> that's frantic and like just crazy and you know we'll call it you know there's a lot of trauma involved when you try and reflect back on it it's it can take a long time to get all of that back sure yeah but sometimes that something you see or smell or taste can like trigger a memory very quickly and easily and i think that's exactly what happens on the very first thing tattersall says which i don't really comprehend why that's the first thing she says but if she opens her eyes after being unconscious for six days and says i heard the coin drop captain it's mm -hmm. the very first thing she says and that's when the blood drained from parents face he an echo flittered through his memory he said a coin like a question it's like a spinning coin, another question. And then he's starting to put it back together. And it says, the voices of gods, of dead men and women, howls of hounds, all pieces of my memories torn tapestry. And so I think just that one little phrase she said triggered a memory or helped him focus on something that had been, I guess, tickling at the back of his mind. I don't know. I think that's, that's very reasonable. So she's awake. That kind of startles him. I'm curious, why was that the very first thing she said? After being unconscious. Do you remember the last thing that she was conscious of before she lost it? No, I don't remember. What do you hear? Spinning coin. It was, that was the question. Oh. What do you hear? And she's answering the question. Oh, was that Hairlock asking him? I don't think it was. I, I mean, we can, we can only really speculate. I, I'm pretty strong on it being Tashrin because we know that Tashrin arrived, but she was already unconscious when he did arrive. And that's what he wanted to know. It's like, what do you hear? She still had, like, even as messed up as she was, she still cast a spell to keep Perrin hidden from Tashrin when he came calling. That's what Hairlock says. Well, it is what Hairlock says, but I'm going to go with that one. I believe it. No, I, I think it says later in the chapter that she said, it's like, there's no way I had the power to do that. She might be lying, too, though. There's a, well. 
Okay, so there's two different places where they talk about it, actually. Before she becomes conscious, Perrin is kind of going over what he's... He's met Hairlock. He has talked to Hairlock. They've been there. They've shared space together. And Hairlock's yeah. given him a fair bit of information, some of which is weird and, and kind of contradictory. He won't even tell Perrin Tattersale's name. And he seems... He has a lot of animosity towards both of them. But he does tell Perrin that Tattersail sprung wards to hide him from Tashrin. And she denies it later on. After she's awake, she's denying it. One of the things to clarify is that this is the first time Perrin and Tattersail have seen each other con consciously and actually interacted. <laughs> yeah. But neither one of them <laughs> trusts the other one. And so they're kind of like dancing around each other's conversations and giving half truths. Certainly not giving the full truth because full trust is not there. Why? Pick a side. Perrin is there to take command of the bridge burners, which he suspects are up to something, right? Tattersail knows that the bridge burners are up to something. <laughs> do, you, do you, is that what you think Perrin thinks of the bridge burners? No, well, no, because we know he has a uh, an expectation to find who was involved with all the deaths that one day. He's looking for somebody in very specific. That's true. Yeah. He's looking for whoever was at Itko Khan. We know that Tattersail has developed a relationship of sorts with the bridge burners. Like she knows them. She's made a deal with them. She's working with them. And here's their new commander who's brought to her almost dead. And now they're meeting for the first time. Yeah. Well, remember, but Perrin is, is undercover. I mean, yes, he's technically has the rank of captain, but that was all kind of contrived for the sole purpose of putting him into this position. He's working for Lorne. He reports to Lorne, and um, he's, I don't know, it's kind of like espionage. He, he's on a mission, and he's not on the level. That's, can we say that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And Tattersail doesn't know any of that stuff, and he's not revealing any of that stuff. Right. That is true. He, he is not. But Tattersail also knows that Whiskey Jack is walking a fine line between duty and deception. Tattersail has no real reason to assume that this guy, the new commander, Perrin, she has no reason to assume that he's anything other than a noble from Unta who's come to take over the bridge burners. Everybody thinks that he's just some noble that got his way in undeservedly. Yeah, but every commander right? who takes charge of the bridge burners dies. Does yeah. she have any reason to think he's anything more than just a young kid that's in charge? Well, if she thinks about the hound, I don't think it'll be a problem. Yeah. there's Okay, that's fair. Yeah, he's special <laughs> somehow. That's fair. And not only that, they have the coin, and he died and isn't dead. And she basically tells him that, too. All right, so let's start looking closely. Well, she tells him, a god intervened, Cap Captain Perrin, returned you to life. So Whiskey Jack was right, then. You're not just some new captain. You're something a lot more. See? She knows. She's suspected. Yeah, okay, you're right. So right. this is because she's had a conversation with Whiskey Jack, though. And then she's seen this guy you know, basically in his skivvies, attack and succeed in wounding the dog, the hound. Gear. Who should have been immune to any mundane weapon. Sure. And he, uh, Perrin talks about the fact that he, he purchased that sword three years ago, and this was the first time he had ever used it. Yeah, and this is cool. This is a flashback. When Perrin had died, essentially, and he was at Hood's Gate, and Opan came and, and basically stopped. And mm, we like your sword. Made Exactly. Yeah. They even mentioned that it has a name, but they don't say what the name exactly. was. Exactly. And I went rack and I read the entire book looking for that name and I never found it. Did you notice though that it was in there that it just wasn't capitalized because they weren't referring to it as he said that they're the gods of chance. Right. Oh, wow. The gods so of the sword, the gods of chance. I get it. Now so I get it. It's there, but it's not capitalized because it's just their domain. It wasn't, it wasn't what he named his sword, even though that's what he named his sword. He Pretty named his sword sneaky. chance. Pretty so no sneaky. wonder they noticed. How did they know what he had named his sword? How? They're paying attention. It's obvious. I mean, are, they're not omniscient, are they? I don't know, man. Do they, they read know. his mind? I don't know. I don't know. Clearly. When it is pertinent to them, they're aware. You know how, okay, so later on when Tattersail's coming back to her quarters, mm -hmm. she pauses before her door and she mentally checks her wards, right? Yes. So she like approaches, she's not thinking about her wards, they're in place, she just, she cast them and she left them, and now she's coming home, 
she mentally acknowledges her wards and tests them and they're all intact. So she then goes inside. Maybe it's like that. Maybe, maybe when anything, anything plucks a string that a pawn is connected to, they're like, what was that? Well, that may be true. And here's another thing. You know how like sometimes when you say the name of a God or a devil or a demon out loud, people are like, be quiet. You don't want to attract his attention. It may be the same thing. He's, oh, yeah. He said the word chance. And that's all it took. Maybe. Do you remember? I mean, like, Tattersail's real cagey about all this stuff. You remember Quick Ben, Tayshrin, Hairlock? They've all been, like, throwing around the name. And she's like, oh, God, don't do this. Stop. What are you doing? They're paying attention. Perrin wants to leave. Yeah. Does he really want to leave? Well, he says he wants to. He's like, I got to get out of here. He, he does. To, yeah. Okay, so what happens? Tell me, uh, tell me what happens when he threatens to leave. Well, Tattersail pretty much convinces him to stay, saying that she needs him here still. I mean, it's more important than just saying, I need you to stay here. Well, she gives him reason also. What's the reason? Well, she talks about Hairlock and that he doesn't fear Tattersail. What he fears is Perrin's sword. Now, I don't know if she's talking literally his sword or his standing in as a sword for her. But either way, there's something about him that Herlock is scared of. She'd reached through to him with her admission. So she used honesty to convince him to stay, I think is what happened there. Okay. But then later on, he still doubts what she says. Like when she's saying that Herlock lied to Perrin about how she could use her power when she was in a weakened state. Weakened state. And even after that, he still isn't sure if she's telling him a, t a whole truth. Sure. So, I mean, yeah, maybe it was that moment of vulnerability that got him. But well, Perrin is a truth teller. Uh huh. He's like that's why Lauren hired him in the first place because he he says exactly what he's seeing and et cetera. And I think he respects that. And she was being cagey with him. She was trying not to answer any of his questions right here. And then he's like, all right, I'm good enough, I'm out. And she's like, look, this is really what's going on. He's afraid of your sword. He's like, okay, well, now that I understand. Should we do the wards? The what? The wards. And he said, what about the wards protecting you? And he said, Herlock said there were wards about you. And Tattersell said, I barely, I've barely the strength to sit straight. If I attempted to open my warren in this state, the power would consume me, burn me to ashes. Or she said the puppet lied. Well, see, that's what I was kind of referencing. So someone's lying. This whole chapter is about lying. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Seriously, this whole chapter, from the moment they get up, they're lying and, and deceiving each other while still giving half-truths and trying to make friends and get information. But at the very end of this section, they sort of reconcile and find an even playing ground. Perrin, he said, sooner or later... You and I will have to cut past all this misleading game playing. Opon or no, we've got a common enemy. And he said, thank you, Captain Perrin. And I think that was very sincere. And then she smiled at him. It's good to meet you. But then he's like, oh, she's playing at it again. Because right even now, he's feeling like she's trying to manipulate him by being friendly. At any rate, what enemy is he talking about? The common enemy. I mean, I know what I think. What do you think, Yule? Of all the people that he knows that she would know, and he wouldn't be against the Empress or Lorne, so what, Herlock? Let's look at what they both know right now, right? Uh -huh. They've both had a tussle with the, the Hound of Shadow. Uh -huh. And Herlock wants to kill them both. In Shadow Throne. And Herlock has animosity towards both of them. Yeah, it could be Herlock. He led the Hound to them. Yeah. So, like, the Hound and Shadow... Aren't even really. Maybe Opon. Maybe he feels Opon's their common enemy. No, he Think said, about oh. what Perrin's mission is right now. Like, what's his mission? To take out Sari. Who is the rope? The rope. But they right. haven't talked about that yet, have they? Yeah, but she does. He doesn't know. She knows. No, but they've both had a run in with the the hound. Does he know that it's a hound of shadow? That's the question. I think he does. He knows the hounds attacked Itko Khan. He definitely knows that. So, and then they know that Shadow Throne basically is in charge of the hounds. Therefore, he knows. Well, suspects Shadow Throne is in charge. So who who do you vote for? Who do you think is the common enemy right now? I don't know. It'd be a little bit more nebulous. He is essentially an agent for the Empire, for the good of the Empire. She is essentially a mage for the good of the Empire. In that regard, they have... They're on the same team? They're on the same team, yes. Oh, it might just be that simple. Yes. 
we have a common enemy, which is everybody else. Lauren says something like that later on. Trust me, I'm leaving, but we're all on the same team and we're all working towards the same goal. I'm good. I'm good to leave it like that. So that essentially ends that section. There's a couple of things we need to talk about though. Can you guys please take a look at the section where it says that Hairlock had vowed to kill Perrin? Yes, he did. When did that happen? I went through this entire book. We never see him talking with him. He never threatened to kill. Perrin. It was one of the days that we didn't witness after the hound attack. No, no, no. Tattersail's telling him that Harlock threatened to kill you. He vowed to kill you. Is Where what does he, he said. say well, this? She was never unconscious during anything. 207. Was it possibly when Perrin was unconscious and she was taking care of him? That's the only way she could have heard anything. I just don't think so. Do you think that's a... I think that's a lie. I think, I think she's lying to Perrin there to get him on her side. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's no, there's no way she could have known that at all. And it's right after he's, he's told this information that he threatens to stomp out of there, right? But no, she says, beware him. It was his unleashing of the Warren of Chaos that left me fevered. So, errata, errata. Yule was correct. We dismissed you, and I apologize for that. Wait, what do you mean? When we did the chapter when Tattersail was attacked by Gear, you had asked if Hairlock had attacked her with his magic, and we were like, nah, but he did. It's obvious. Well, now. she's saying that if she's not telling No, I went back, I went back and reread it. Oh, okay. And she started vomiting because of the, right. the chaos. And now she's like that was caused the fever was caused by his his magic. But so. he wasn't fighting the hound, was he? Why did Whoa, he, wait he a second? Sp- Hold on a second now. What? I'm gonna give Harlock a I'm gonna be his lawyer for a second. Golden she Duke. said it was his unleashing, and since his warren is diametrically opposed to her. Maybe that's why she was throwing up. Well, that's I agree. That's why. But point but he, is, what he's why not he, specifically trying to hurt her. Kind of like just, Amanda Rake. Exactly. What he's going to do is going to hurt her, though. He was uncaring about its effect as an area of effect. Yeah. Right. Maybe, he's mad, Captain, and he vowed to kill you. <laughs> which I I argue is not true. Sure, maybe. I think that's a manipulation on her part. There's okay. no evidence in the book that I read that says that Herlock is trying to kill Perrin. It may be true, but he never said it. Well, he's got like the the mad gleam and there's all sorts of animosity going on there. Perrin acknowledges that, but there's n- how would Tattersail know that anyway? Um, okay, so what do you guys think about the fact that Perrin has already foregone his mission at this point? He's just met this woman and he's already thrown his mission to the wind. I don't think he has. You brought this up. No, I, I'm getting there. What he does say right here is he told himself that his mission overrode all other concerns, that he'd repaid his debt to her even if there was one, and that she hadn't given him all the reasons he suspected existed for his staying hidden. And yet he he remains hidden. Yes. So on some level, he's already siding with her over his employers. She gave him a viable reason on why he should stay. In this section? In this section, he was convinced to stick around, but it didn't sound like... Because Hairlock's the threat? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think it is Hairlock. Yeah, I think it is. I think that's what she said, is that if he left, Hairlock would kill her. Yeah, so he just is like, he's already been stabbed and almost died, and he's been watching her. Just like she got stuck with him, he is stuck with her, and, you know, that'll play out later. Already the uh, connection between them is beginning growing. So she has elicited sympathy from him by saying, if you leave, I'm going to die. Tug, tug, tug on old heartstring there. Feminine wiles. Woo-hoo. Okay, um, one more thing, if you guys are ready to move on. Can you guys please look at page 206 in the middle? Perrin studied her round, ghostly, pale face. It was, he saw, a friendly face, and he couldn't recall the last time he'd experienced such a thing. It left him off balance with only tatter seal to steady him. And that made him feel as if he were descending a spiral with the sorceress at the center. Descending. Perhaps it was an ascent. He wasn't sure. And the uncertainty made him wary. Now, does that, got, does that make you guys think of anything in particular? I see what you're saying when you're talking about the uh, deck of dragons and she did that spiral kind of looking down into a well type thing yes it was i thought the exact same thing it was almost the same story she had a spiral but from her description at the same time she couldn't tell whether it was ascending or descending so that's on page 115 for those of you that want to go and look and so what i did is i went back and i looked 
at that spiral that she had laid out because Perrin is not an adept as far as we're aware, right? Right. And he's not dealing with the deck of dragons. He's just got this sense about her, but the way that he's describing it is as if he were doing a reading from the deck of dragons where he's reading the whole deck and she's at the bottom of the pit, but he, maybe it's a mountain. He's not real sure. He said something about it. It's either an epiphany or I don't remember. So I think we're supposed to make that connection. Like, I think we're supposed to remember the, the previous spiral, but what, what does that mean? They have a psychic connection. They're now bound in ways that are not detectable. I mean, to me, that's throwing up alarm bells, big ones. I think maybe you're right that it's just supposed to be a connection between the two of them, but it's weird to me that he's got anything to do with the deck of dragons. You know what really frustrates me? What's that? Erickson does this all the time. Where a character goes, and in this instance, she knew its meaning. But he never tells you. Escorted by Dujek, Lorne gets a sense of the situation in Pale. So we're back with Lorne. She and Talk have arrived at the north gate of Pale. And they're waiting for another horse so they don't have to share a horse anymore. But instead of another horse, Dujek arrives. And they went somewhere after that. They did. But the first thing that she observes, and Lauren's an observant woman. Let's give her some credit. Um, just seeing the gate guards, she comments to talk that it looks like an unhappy army. And he explains that they are. Why are they unhappy? Despite the fact that they have just got extremely decimated in friendly fire. Besides that, yeah. Uh, they said they're going to, what, disband them or join them with a... There was two things. They were talking about disbanding the bridge burners, yes. Uh, dismantling of the second and the sixth armies, reshuffling command, squads split up everywhere. Yeah, and these are your brothers. Yeah, and he said, nobody's where they were before, right down to the greenest recruit. The squads would be like family, brothers and sisters, right? And splitting up squads, I think that's kind of unheard of. But obviously it's not, because they did it. It seems like the army doesn't like it, though. But maybe they just want an excuse not to be happy. I think you're right. It's like, you don't do that because that destroys your morale. You get used to trusting the person next to you. Yeah. That is a tactic when you're trying to combat dissent and... Well, who's in charge right now? Tashwin. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Brilliant military strategist. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's this moment of deceit where Lauren is like, thank you, soldier, that'll be all. And Dujek's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know who talk is. We know what talk is. If you value him, get him out of the city. So we leave talk behind and Lorne and Dujek take off together. So there's a lot of information in this section as they walk. We get uh, the stuff that's happening in the city right now. The preparations for the culling of the nobility. We see that the Malazans are kind of managing while the locals are rebuilding and et cetera. Well, they also talked about a little bit about the healing process taking place, you know. Rebuilding is part of that process though. It is. And it's immediate. Like as soon as it got destroyed, they're, they're cleaning it up, they're fixing things, they're rebuilding, they're putting people to work to keep them busy. Yeah, but they, they talk about the Malazan strategy for not just conquering a city, but incorporating its people. Brilliant, by the way. What a recipe. I guess the biggest part I get is when we start off is that Lorne is very well aware that you've got an army of 10,000 unhappy soldiers who are all under the command of like the most brilliant commander the Malazan Empire has ever produced. Not a good scenario. Well, for the Empress anyway. Yeah, there's some risk there. It says it. Yeah, no, I, I know. What I got out of this is an incredible appreciation for Dujek. Such a cool guy. Yeah, it's kind of, a lot of it's built here. Some of it was built in chapter four, I think, before the bridge burners left pale. We get a little bit of Dujek there, and I, I started to really like him then, but this is really the chapter where we start to get Dujek and see the man. Yeah, not just a likable commander who's taking his licks too, but a brilliant strategist. He's just so good. Yep. Dujek takes Lauren back to kind of like the command center, and she comments that they're going through a gate that looks brand new. What happened to that gate? Do you guys remember? No, I don't. The Hound of Shadow destroyed it. Oh, that was the gate? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's the one. So yeah, rebuilt the gate. Okay, and along the way, um, once they get inside this big three-story structure, there are soldiers everywhere with their hands on their swords. And their, And she's like, have there been attempts on your life, Dujek? And he's like, yeah, four. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even recognize them. I don't know if it's a man or a woman anymore. Like, these guys, that they're... 
I didn't tell them to protect them. They chop fools up. This is how we're getting an idea of how I mean, we, we know these guys are loyal, right? These are loyal soldiers. They love Dujek. This is one of the ways that Erickson shows us how loyal, how much they love Dujek. He tells the soldiers to go away, but they refuse. Yeah, he can't keep them away. The coolest part here is that Lauren comes here and she knows that Tayshrin has been in charge and interfering and that everything has just gone to hell in a handbasket. And Dujic has just sit calmly by and let Tayshrin hang himself with his own incompetence. And Lauren walks into this and she sees exactly what's happening. And she says, hey, I know what's really going on here. Um, I'm going to put Tayshrin in his place. And if you need me to back you, I will. And then he says, I can take care of my own problems, adjunct. She's already figured out a lot of stuff. She doesn't tell him what he's figured out, but she does offer her support. And he offers her the opportunity to hear what's going on from someone's perspective besides the guy who's in charge, supposedly in charge. Right. Although we all probably realize it's really Dujek, not Tayshrin. She appreciates this offer and she hears him out. And she asks him about the Moranth. Have they been giving you any trouble? At first they were. Yeah. He said he'd been having trouble with the gold. And the gold Moranth are their elite warriors. And he said, I've had a hard time getting them to fight Caliban and Brood. That seems they consider him too honorable to treat as an enemy. Yeah, 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 that's right. I mean, that gives a whole different perspective of who Caliban and Brood is. It also gives you a little bit. I mean, the Moranth, I mean, they're giving you the munitions and they're helping them fly across land. But at the same time, they're exacting a toll, taking out people in cities and, you know, all sorts of stuff that the Malazans kind of have to put up with, it seems like. From all reports, it sounds like it's a tenuous agreement that they have now. And so Lorne suggests that he take advantage of the alliance as long as it remains in place. Right. Use them for what you can because it might not last. That's a difficult one, though. So, like, if you were told to go and fight somebody and you're like, I can't. That, that, that dude's like a hero to me. Like, that's a tough – that's a that's a between a rock and a hard place, right? They've also gone into agreement with the Empire, so they're stuck. They have somebody that's honorable, that they respect, and then they have this obligation to uphold their, their commitment. They're stuck between a rock and a hard place with their values. That's how agreements get broken. They're in a tenuous spot. And it's it's acknowledged by the adjunct. So this is the part that you were talking about a second ago, Yule. I was trying to uh, piggyback it on what you were saying when you were saying how good a leader Dujek is, even from behind sometimes. He's still getting his way. And when he is talking with Lorne about how the troops are going to be divvied out over the course of the campaign and the next season and all this other stuff, He's not really happy with what he hears. And so he is able to get Lorne to be receptive, to hear what his ideas are. And by the end of it, he's got his way. And I think that's really cool. Well, yeah, and not just that, but like he, he literally, he hears what she says and then he looks at the map and then he just like rearranges all the strategy in his mind and says, no, do this instead. Yeah, and he's, he's telling the Empress basically what to do if you think about it that way. He's like changing an entire plan. That's his you know? job, though. Uh-huh. I mean, he's the brilliant strategist. They recognize his talents. Yeah, I don't want to get too into the, you know, how he was talking about divvying up the troops, but it is a cool thing. No. None of it none of it is unplumbable stuff, right? It's all pretty obvious right. what's going on. Yeah. Well, okay, so my companions do not hold Dujek in as high regard as I do because this is fascinating for me. Like when you really start getting into like strategy and how it happens and how a normal person cannot do this. Okay. But we didn't get a lot of strategy anyway. It's just, he's making changes and that's great. Good for him. He's a strategist. It's his job. If I understood what he was talking about a little bit more, it might have a little bit more meaning to me, but the that's thing fair. I can, the kernel that you have to get from this is that the dude knows what's going on and has a really good way of getting what he needs done done. And the Empress gives him pretty much free reign to do so. Sure thing. So think about like when someone's in charge and then you have all these channels you have to go through. He can still get all the people along the way to the Empress to listen to him. He can open the door with just the way he operates. And I think that is what we're really looking at here. Dude, he's like third in command. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, he is high up. Don't get he's me wrong. So, he's the highest person in the military. He is the, the top most piece 
of one quarter of the empire. Like when Lorne divided the empire into four different sections earlier, there was the military, there was the claw, there was the empress and the adjunct, and then there's Tashrin with the wizards. He's way up there. So yeah, he's yeah. got the empress's ear. Sure. And obviously when he makes a suggestion, they... They can't give him any more troops, but that's probably just a limitation, right? They just literally can't. Nevertheless, he makes his adjustments and that's when Tashrin arrives. He comes in and he's like throwing blame, <laughs> like right off the bat. He's like, it's your fault that this happened. What happened? The Hall of Records, the house that houses all the records, uh, it's burning. It's, it's up in flames. All the records of who a noble person is, is gone. And even though <laughs> Dujek was like, yeah, I'll uh, call the nobility like you want. So what you're saying is this is how Dujek thwarted Tashrin. Let's talk about what Tashrin had in mind, though, because we haven't talked about so, that. We've so, mentioned the culling. So it's kind of like standard Malazan practice. They take over city and then they kill one in 10 of the nobility. And it's not hard. They pick out the ones that are most despised and disliked. And then they string them up in front of the public. And then all of a sudden, you know, the people are like, oh... Yeah, they got all the bread of the bad nobility. You sound awesome. But Tatian wanted to do the opposite. He wanted to kill nine out of 10, which was pretty darn harsh by any standards. So, including children. Yes, including children, correct. And Dujek wasn't, wasn't into that. No, in it, fact, didn't Dujek actually ask Lorne if killing children would be involved? But I don't think it's a, that kind of a question. She says, uh -huh. it's empire policy. You're aware of that high fist. And he's like, nine out of 10 nobles to hang, including children? And she's like, that seems excessive. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So he's informing her. She didn't know that this was what Tayshern had planned. Right. He's telling her, this is uh -huh. what Tayshern has planned. And when she offers to help, he's like, I don't need your help because I'm going to burn this building down. You already had a I've already, or it's already burned. <laughs> it's already <laughs> fixed. Problem solved. I don't need your help. Does this I remind see. you guys of anything else, perhaps from chapter one? Yeah, wasn't there um, some records uh, Perrin went to go search out, and when he got there, there were people that were, what, were dead? Everybody was dead, and the, and the hall was full of pigeons. Yeah, and they were, like, mocking him or something like that. I don't understand. Yeah, to this did. day, I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah, I don't get it. But there were no records to be had, right? No, they were all destroyed. Or or the ones that were, were like super brittle or something like that? Everything was illegible and destroyed, like turned to ash or yeah. fell apart when he touched it, turned to dust. So anyway, just something to think about. We've seen something like this before, but this was, this was Dujek's work. Well, it's a little bit like Whiskey Jack, too. You know they're good buds, right? So a little bit of subterfuge, a little bit of working within the rules, behind the rules. There's more than one way to get around the rules to make sure you do the right thing. Tayshrin can't prove it anyway. Yeah, I know. Although Dujek said he'd have his best men look into it. <laughs> <laughs> and there, you know, there's that comment from Tayshrin about spies. You wouldn't want to take away work from your spies or something like that. Dub, you know, double dipping. I don't know. But, but Tayshrin has his own spies. So who's he calling the kettle black? So when Tayshrin arrives and he's throwing his fit and Dujek's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, if you'll excuse me. And then Lauren asks him if there will be a formal dinner tonight. And he says, yes. And she's like, invite Tattersail. He's like, if she's feeling all right, you got it. And then he departs. Then Lorne and Tashrin have their one-on-one -on -one debrief, essentially. And boy. <laughs> and he moans like a little bleep. She lays into him pretty seriously. So what's the, what's the biggest takeaway that you guys found in this section where she's telling Tashrin that he lacks subtlety and et cetera? What's, what's y'all's biggest takeaway? That he was given a specific objective and he is handling it with obvious skill. I was going to, I was thinking, uh, he's, he's got his own point of view that he's following. Don't we all though? Yeah. Well, what do you mean? Be clear. Later on in the chapter. I don't know if I like the way this is going, but all right. It's, okay. it's all right. We'll have a conversation about what your duty is. In fact, so will Tashrin. He'll be there. And he's not doing what he's supposed to do. The thing about Tashrin is that he has his own agenda. And although he is tasked to do something, he is going to put his own little stink on it. 
Do you think that? Well, if we're having this conversation, yeah, that's what I think yeah, is that was going on. Kind of a bad question, but I did, I got the feeling, I mean, that may be true. I can't think of any examples that fit that and I would not doubt it, but I think he was given an objective and he is just as as a leader and an manager, administrator, he's kind of incompetent. I mean, he's powerful. I agree with you all completely. But he is he has a lot. He has a malice behind what he does like being incompetent is not getting people killed when you're supposed to let's talk about what he did the reason i think yule is correct is because he commandeered the assault on moonspawn yeah he wanted that job he took it away from dujek like we got into the tussle about you know did circle breaker want his job and we're like Ugh kind of unclear right but this is stated factually he commandeered the assault and then what did he do yeah, he killed the bridge burners. He was supposed to. He was raining fire on Moonspawn. They call it Moon Rain, right? It's all wrecked the city of Pale. It's all, all the pieces of basalt and stuff that fell down. Well, that collapsed the tunnels and killed most of the bridge burners. Like, what did he think was going to happen? That was his objective. But what Yule's talking about, the malice was, why did he try to kill Bellardon? Why did he try to kill Tattersail? Why did he try and succeed in killing Acheronis and Nightchill? Were they part of the old guard? Does he care that much? He's part of the old guard. Why is he killing the wizards? He wasn't told to kill the wizards. He was told to kill the old guard. You think he's just trying to maintain his position? He wanted that job. Why would he want that job? Why would he take on that responsibility? He admits that this, I'm out of my depth. I don't know what I'm doing. This is not my strong suit. You should take this job away from me. He only wanted it long enough because he saw he could take advantage of the situation and kill off rivals. So you think he, okay, you're convincing me. You think he took this job, now he's bowing out. Yep, because he's, he's done what he needed to do. And now he's intentionally doing a bad job, so he gets relieved of command? Maybe, maybe not. He might be an idiot when it comes to managing people. Like, she says that, somebody says that wizards do not command respect. They command fear. And killing nine out of ten of the nobles, that's a uh, that's a fearful thing, right? And how out of touch is Tashrin? He's the high mage of the Malazan military. How out of touch is this guy? I'm guessing he doesn't get a lot of normal social interaction. None, probably. Everybody fears him for the most part. The only person that we know that like gave him tet a tet was Hairlock. And I'm sure Dujek does too. They're powerless against each other. They can't really openly fight. Nevertheless, that's why I think Yule's correct. I think he manipulated the situation and now he doesn't need to anymore. He got what he wanted. I think there's room for both theories to be sure accurate. Thing. What was yours? My theory is that he's just completely incompetent. He carried out his personal agenda, which is what he really cares about, and he apparently did a good job at doing that. And But then the mission that he was given, he's failed at because he's incompetent. You think he failed? I don't know. I, I think he's being a poor manager of the takeover of the city, but he did succeed in taking the city. Yeah, he, he moved uh, Moonspawn along, didn't yep. he? He got him. He got him out he of there. He has a victory. I'm not disagreeing with that component either. I'm just saying he's doing a very poor job. I think that's the assessment of Lorne as well. Yeah. And I think that maybe he's smart enough that he did it on purpose and that now he's getting kicked out of the position because he doesn't want it anymore. You know what they say? If you don't want to do a job, then do a really poor job the yeah. first time and they'll never ask you to do it again. Exactly. So Lorne tells Tashrin that Dujek is not the enemy. And he's like, but but he's a traitor. But he is part of the old guard. This is the section that we've been speculating about for a very long time where we get confirmation what the orders were. Like, why did everything in the takeover of Pale go so wrong? Why did all the bridge burners die? But in this chapter, we find out that they really are trying to kill off the old guard. That is really part of the deal. The attack on Whiskey Jack command not really a surprise anymore i'm proud of us i think we we got it we read this book up to this point and we have fairly correctly assessed what erickson was trying to tell us it only took me seven times i know <laughs> <laughs> i know but we got it we finally got it so tashrin gets his new orders lorne finds out that opon has entered the game Perrin is still missing, as far as they're aware. Tashrin suspects he's dead. His body's hidden. He hasn't passed through Hood's Gate, but he doesn't know where he is or what's happening. As this is all winding down, Lorne remembers 
who Tattersail is. She <laughs> has this like psychic temporal flashback. And she remembers one night, nine years ago, in the mouse. Quarter. The mouse quarter, right? Not in a mouse. Which we will recall is the uh, the scene of the riots mm-hmm. from the prologue. Chapter zero, yeah. Lorne was this little bitty girl 11 years old in the mouse quarter as it was like burning and the riots were going out of control and things are getting really nasty and she's remembering this now and I don't know how she knew or remembered Tattersail's name but she's like Tattersail yes so she remembers Tattersail this section of the chapter we got a lot of information that we didn't actually talk about because it, it kind of was a scatter gun type of a deal where we just got a bunch of information, little piece here, little piece there. We didn't relay all of it. We did mention that the culling of the old guard was overtly stated. That was part of the plan. Tattersail's name was on that list. Whiskey Jack's name is on that list. Dujek is exempt. Do you guys know of any other names that should be on that list? No, Maybe. No, but she did say every other name on that list has already been removed. Everybody's been removed. Who is alive? Think about a wizard that's not dead. Belurden. Belurden is part of the old guard, but he's not on the list. So he's exempt for some reason. We don't know that. Where yes, did come we from? do. He was around before Tattersail was around, and Tattersail's part of the old guard. Why in the heck do they want to get rid of the old guard anyway? The explanation is that they will ever work against the Empress and the Empire. That explanation is given in this section. But why? Sounds petty. Because they were loyal to the old Emperor. Who's dead. That makes no sense. I don't know that it makes any sense. Like, I think that we had kind of come to the conclusion that it was pointless to do it now. Like, they're dying off anyway. I mean, it was stated openly as much by Whiskey Jack. But Bellardin's not on that list. Somebody else that should be on that list, even if it's the exempt list, is Tashrin. Why is he exempt? Well, he is doing what the Empress wants. So is Dujek. So why does Tashrin think Dujek is a traitor? Because he's not very wise. I think he doesn't like Dujek. I think that's probably it also. If Tashrin is actually trying to carve out the Empire for himself, Dujek would be a rival, right? Yeah, he would definitely get in the way. And he has, by burning de- records down. Dujek is awesome. Tattersail considers the bridge burners and Perrin as an invitation arrives. All right, so we're back in Tattersail's quarters, which is my least favorite place in this entire chapter. <laughs> She's kind of playing out her thoughts. She is considering the MO of the Empire something that we got a hint of earlier when Dujek and Lorne were walking and we saw, you know, about the culling and the, et cetera. She goes into more detail though, how the empire will come in, they'll take over a city, they'll treat the sick and the wounded. And I mean, everybody, nobody is left out in the cold. Then they call the nobility and they make it public. So everybody's complicit. Even if they were benevolent rulers, they twist it. It's like spinning the news, right? You spin the news, and then once you've convinced everybody that you're doing them a favor by killing the nobility and you let them watch, then you recruit them. A tried and true procedure that swelled recruitment on a tide of base vengeance and every hand stained by a righteous glee. I don't know. I just love this stuff. It's like the handbook of Kyranny. <laughs> yeah, you ever read uh, The Prince? Machiavelli, yes. I can sense your dislike of this part. <laughs> We're stuck in her chambers. I can't stand it when that happens. It's only a page and two. Uh, fortunately, it's very short. And we get I a mean, lot of good information, but I do not like being cooped up in her apartment. I hear you. Well, either does Parent. So Tattersail's thinking about Whiskey Jack. Well, because he ditched her with Perrin. And he, she doesn't really know the plan, right? I mean, she does, but she doesn't. She doesn't need to know, and it's best probably. Is that what it is? I assume so. Why would she need to know what the plan is? No, I agree. She has no need to know. Whiskey Jack just said, keep him alive. That was it. What does she say? She questions. Are you talking about Whiskey Jack or Perrin? Yeah, Whiskey Jack. Okay. Whiskey Jack is a man pushed to the edge, or rather the edge creeping on him on all sides, a crumbling of beliefs, a failing of faith, leaving as his last claim to the humanity of squad, a shrinking handful of the only people that mattered anymore. And she's kind of like questioning him. I think the core part here is that she's compassionate and she's very concerned about him. So is she concerned about him because she cares about him you know, just as a person? Or is it she's worried that she's gotten herself in with someone who is like falling apart, basically? Is doomed. I think maybe a little bit of both, to be honest. I think she's naturally compassionate on some level. And I also think that 
she is evaluating his position and he's a desperate man trying to save his own squad. And it seems like the entire world is out to get Whiskey Jack, but he won't stop. And she's wondering maybe if she should side with him. I don't know. Or you mean having a second doubts about having sided with him? I think some second doubts, but I also, I think there's an enormous amount of respect implied in the statement too. He is holding it all together despite everything that's happened to him because she knows his history. And she talks about or thinks about Quick Ben and Callum and how they've kind of taken a lot of the responsibility to like, you know, prop up Whiskey Jack also. They're trying to relieve as much pressure on that's on him as possible. Right. And everybody in the squad is doing the same thing. And mm-hmm. they said it so eloquently when they talked about Quick Ben and Callum, they said it, it was their only means of loving the man. Okay, so Erickson has showed us a character that has, in my opinion, been pretty well revealed. Like, we like Whiskey Jack, don't we? Right. And we also like Quick Ben and we like Kalam, even though, you know, maybe they're killers, whatever. We like them. And now we're seeing it from an outside perspective. We're seeing it from Tattersale's perspective. And she sees that Whiskey Jack's under a lot of pressure, that he's in an untenable position, and that his squad love him. It's like reinforcement. When we get to see it from an outside perspective, we're like, we've already developed our own feelings, but now we're seeing it from her side. And it's a very nice character detail for her and for the bridge burners. Oh, okay. So she's, she essentially in turn goes through and she considers all of the bridge burners. She considers Whiskey Jack. She considers Kalam and Quick Ben and then the rest of the guys. And then she considers their new captain. And what does she consider him? Well, I think she acknowledges that there's some attraction between them, right? He's he's in the other room, oiling his sword. <laughs> it was the mystery and the uncertainty that made them so attracted to one another. Uh oh, it's getting exciting. Yeah, it's getting hot. That's why ATN doesn't like it in the in uh, tatter sales room. I don't particularly find it exciting myself, but um, that's all right. Well, it's like, you know, it's like love, man. It's, you don't care about it. <laughs> you know, interpersonal communications. <laughs> right. Right. It's like, damn the world. I want to get laid. Yeah. <laughs> well, so does Perrin. Well, so I know. Perrin. Well, okay. To be less crass, she acknowledges the fact that there's a strong physical connection between them. She stopped short of love. I think she's implying lust. There's a lot of conversation of Perrin when he was talking about talk, saying I hadn't had a companionship like this in a while. And then here she is saying, I haven't felt like this in a while. He also said she's a friendly face, maybe. Yeah, exactly. But but Perrin's a kid. He's like 22 or 23 years old and probably hasn't got any action in a long time, right? And so he's stuck here without a mission. He's got this woman pretty much that's the only they're cooped up together yeah i'm serious this is like a recipe for sexy time yes something fun and hot and exciting let's talk about hairlock instead i think he's a lot more interesting he was puppets hairlock had returned in the morning and he was agitated and he was uncommunicative and he was being cryptic and tattersail and infers that he had found a trail it was going to lead him out of the city and to Darujistan. And she said that that was not a happy thought. Why wouldn't that be a happy thought? Is it because she was supposed to keep an eye on him also, right? I'm sorry, did you say a trail? Do you remember the very last thing Tool said to... Um, We're on the right trail? On Lauren? Yeah, exactly. Do you think there's any correlation there? I hadn't thought of it. Definitely it's possible because... Remember a couple of chapters ago, the word was thread? So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all. If now the, the word has changed to trail, <laughs> because that's how Erickson operates. If it seems like we're neurotic, maybe suspicious of everything we read, it's because we... Evidence suggests that we're right. Well, okay, so but what do you think? Do you think that... Do, why do you think it's a bad thing for, for Hairlock to head off to, to Daruja Sam? I don't know. Well, again, was she supposed to keep an eye on Hairlock also? Yeah. And if he goes and she's not with him, then she's not keeping an eye on him. So is she unhappy because she's going to have to leave Perrin behind? Oh, that might be. Is she unhappy because she has to go to Darugistan and she doesn't want to? Like, why is she unhappy? The previously, she said that she needed Perrin to stay to protect her from Herlock. And if Herlock leaves and there's no reason for Perrin to stay, I don't know. Well, why couldn't they just go together? 
that is a good question. And I, st- I didn't get why I still don't get why. No, I don't either. Like I'm actually confused by why he's not being sent to Darujistan or why he's not wanting to go to Darujistan. Like, it seems to me like he's under someone else's control. It doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. Yeah. I don't get that part either. I don't know if this is a plot hole. Honestly, I don't know. I, I doubt it, but I don't understand what I'm reading here. Do six machina. And if you guys don't understand it, I'm prepared to move on. Yeah. Okay, so the invitation arrives. There's a Marine at the door, and he's like, oh, Tattersail, you're up and at him. How do you feel? And she's like, I feel great. And he's like, great, come to dinner tonight. And she's like, damn, <laughs> I should have lied. Like, he says, if, I, if, if you were to answer this way, I was supposed to invite you to dinner. It's a formal dinner. She's like, who else is going to be there? And he's like, adjunct, Lorne, talk to younger, Dujak, one arm. And she's like, oh. Let's be honest. It's not an invitation. It's an order. It is an order. When the order arrives that she has to go to dinner, she's like, damn it. She's here. And Perrin says, oh, she finally made it. He thought that out loud when he meant to keep it inside. Who knows? Maybe he's been talking out loud to Tattersail while she's been unconscious and it just slipped out. Yeah, and Tattersail infers that that means that he works for Lorne. He's, he has a working relationship. They know each other. Uh, they, he has a reason for being here that has to do with Lorne, and she thinks that they're there to kill the, the bridge burners, basically. Right. So Quick Ben was correct. All those days ago, or whatever, she's now convinced that, yeah, the Empire is trying to kill the bridge burners to a man, and that this man... Like, uh, there goes all that loving feeling. Now she's completely conflicted, but she has to go to dinner. She doesn't have time for this nonsense. The seventh bell, dinner is served. And a lot of accusations too. So we start this section with talk. Like he's the guy that we follow for this section. Yeah. And talk arrives on time to the gathering. And who, uh, Dujek's there. And Lorne. Lorne is there and Tatron's there, right? We're just waiting on Tattersail. Right. Talk is a little bit nervous about going. It's, it's a badge of honor. His scarred face is a badge of honor among the second army. Among this high echelon of people, he's, he's kind of nervous about it. Like he's self-conscious about it's it. Like, yeah. For all intents and purposes, it's like he's regular army and he's meeting at the literally the highest level yeah of leaders on the continent he's a little nervous he's a little nervous these are the reasons why i love dujek straight away dujek puts him at ease what does he say well he rubs the stump of his arm and uh he said bet it's driving you crazy <laughs> and he, he grinned and talk said hey i can scratch with both hands <laughs> <laughs> i don't know so good it is good. So there's a little bit of banter there. Dujek puts talk at ease, which I love Offers him for. Him a drink. He, yeah, gets him a drink. Which, which he'll do again later. Well, here's, but catch this. Lorne actually lied. It wasn't a lie. Let's rephrase that because you know what that really is. No. Oh, no. That I'm... is a soldier's exaggeration. Oh, fair enough. It, she is building him up to the other people at the table, uh, exaggerating his prowess, essentially. Also making him feel little ease, but I think yes. it made him feel uncomfortable. I don't know about that. All right. So if you remember back at the Battle of the Mound, Tok killed two bar guests. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, he did. Yes. And Lauren says, I've explained your vital role in keeping me alive, Tok the Younger. How you loosed four arrows on the fly and brought down four bar guests. And he looked at her sharply and says, I didn't know I had the last two shots in me. <laughs> so he's not, he's not contradicting her, right? No, he, of course not. I don't know. I, I, that was a really good moment for me, for Lauren. Like, I really liked that for her. So Tattersail arrives, and she's wearing this nice dress. And Talk is like, woo, I've never seen such a, wow, you look good. You know, he, he, he's impressed by the way she cleaned up. But Lorne recognizes her now. Lorne has seen her. Lorne was already on her mission. And Lorne's mission is to kill Tattersail? No, 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 no. That no? was what that was the feeling she felt. You don't think you don't think that any of the stuff that she said was an attempt to kill Tattersail just now. Well, let's let's be clear. Tattersail spared Lorne's parents, brothers, sisters, whoever, and, and Lorne. 
Hole? They relocated the survivors yes. in, into a place called Mox Hole where plague ran rampant and all of Lauren's family was killed. Yes. Lauren was not there. Lauren was given to the claw. Right. So that to me was a revelation. It just didn't occur to me that Lauren was claw. She's now the adjunct, so she rose through the ranks, but nevertheless, she's claw. All right, so anyway, we get Lorne's story, essentially, is what happens, right? She explains what's going on, why she's so mad at Tattersail, and she makes these accusations that, you know, this woman is responsible for the death of blah, blah, blah. And Tattersail is just like, I will, I will submit to an inquest or whatnot. I'm not going to pose a defense. Dujek's like, no, that's not happening. And she's like, okay, well, then I challenge her to a duel. No, that's not happening. Dujek stops the whole thing. Right. And that, that was the only, my, my bone of contention. There was no death threat. She was the one saying, well, I submit to this. Well, I'll have a duel with you. And it was Dujek, like you said, coming in each time to stop that. And she's like, he's like, stop this foolishness. Nobody's had was on the chopping block here. She was explaining the situation to Tattersail as she saw it. And then Tattersail is like, well, take my life then. Okay. I mean, okay. I don't, I don't I doubt that Lauren wasn't pissed off and she probably might do something to her. But that wasn't the reason they were having this dinner. I, I just had a little exception at how you said it. Okay. I don't think that's the reason why this whole thing is going on to punish Tattersale. I don't think that's why they're having dinner either. I think that Lauren wants to kill Tattersale. <laughs> yeah, she probably does want to kill her, yes. She was invited to dinner because... She got info. Lauren wants to hear from Tattersale's own lips about that hound. Because Lauren's been looking for the hounds. Lauren's sure. been looking for the things attached to the hound, you know? That's been her job all along for the last seven years or so, nine years. All that is true. I think the meeting here is to get information from Tattersale, but it, only now, only here, did Lauren kind of put it all together. That Tattersale was that person from her memory, that Tattersale was a person that she blamed for killing her parents. We talked about this earlier. I have a hard time believing that, that Lauren would act this way after all these years. I mean, if she was raised by the claw, I mean, that kind of strips you of the petty emotions and ambitions that you have, I think. It, Talk was raised by the claw. Yes, but he, for the, how long has he been with the army, though? It's like when you leave the... How long has Lauren been with the army? You know, I don't know. But what you're saying, Philip, is true because when Dujet comes in and he's like, hey, come on, that's enough of this. He talks about who's to blame during a war for the things that occur. Well, he he's says, supported by Tashrin as well. Right. Well, he, he says, hey, you know, if you're going to blame Tattersail for the death of your family, you might as well Tashrin. And you might as well be me also. And you can go all the way to the Empress herself, who you serve. And then, you know, it still continues the conversation. And then here, going back to Philip, he's all, none of this matters. He's all, you have a job to do, and that's your job. Your personal feelings have nothing to do with this anymore. What does Talk say about that? What does he say of it? That he witnessed an execution. I understand what Philip means, that he thinks it's an overreaction, I believe, is what he's saying. And I don't disagree, but at the same time, you know, maybe he just didn't do it to your liking. I didn't find it to be distasteful, and I didn't find it to take me out of the story. It didn't bother me. My point there is it seemed out of character for her. Now, I could see her being calm and cool and saying, well, I'm still going to get you one day because I know it's you now. But I don't see her flipping out on the dime and creating such drama in the middle of this company. Because when you create that kind of drama, you actually look weak. I don't read her as a blank, cold slate like the Empress. To me, I, I view Lorne as much more human and much more approachable and much more sympathetic. She did express and sympathy for her dead horse. She didn't care about the people, but she cared about the horses. But a lot of people who feel that way about animals are mistrustful of humans. Somebody that's in the claw should be very well aware that humans are not trustworthy. Beside the point, this is designed to elicit an emotional response in the reader. We're supposed to kind of connect with, if that happened to you, you would remember it. Like that's supposed to be a sympathetic thing. Like we're supposed to kind of feel something for Lauren. Remember, these aren't black and white characters. None of them are black and white. Even the Empress isn't black and white. I understand where you're coming from. I just don't read her that way. To me, she's got more camaraderie in her. Like, I feel that the way that she was treating talk, even out on the plane with the horse, was more of like a kind of an underhanded compliment. You know, your horse is a Wiccan horse. I know this. So 
That's fine. People bring to novels a lot of their own stuff, right? You're going to read her the way that you read her because you're you. And I'm going to read her the way I read her because I'm me. Moving on. Moving on. I was saying that Dujek hands a glass of alcohol, wit wine or something to talk the younger to ease him. Yes. Right after the conversation with Lorne and Tattersail, it's talk the younger who then pays it forward and gives Tattersail a drink. He's all here. I think you need a drink. Yes, he does. And, and I he, think that's cool. He, yeah, it was cool. And he also made a joke for her that made her laugh and like kind of broke the ice. Sure. That's what was that when he was talking about her, her, it's her the travel one eye luggage. No, yeah. Well, there's two then. There's oh, okay, two. Yeah. The one eyed joke. You remember that? No, I don't. You're a sight for a sore eye. Oh, he does <laughs> say that. You are, yeah, singular. Very funny. Oh, that's just quippy. I just like it. And then it's a lot of the chapter is talk, paying attention to everybody. And yeah. you get a lot of, a lot of conversation and you get a lot of talk, tell, talking up, or thinking about it. He's pretty observant, wouldn't you say? Oh, he is super observant. It, this is his training is the claw. He's been trained to be observant. He is extremely observant though. It's undeniable. And the first person he appraises is Dujek. Right. So tell me about that. Dujek has an easy, relaxed rapport with the others, including talk. And then with the servants who filed in bearing trays of food, it struck talk that the man had not changed perceptibly from the one talk the elder had called friend. And of course, that impresses talk deeply about him. The talk misses his dad. That's pretty obvious from this chapter. And a lot of people have a lot of things to say about his father. All good. All good. And of course, you know, it makes him miss him more. Lorne was aware of him. The Empress is aware of him. Dujek Duja. here was friends with him. His legend is <laughs> out there. Talk the Elder. All right. So a little bit further down that same page, we get, we, oh, do you remember our conversation about what is an adept? Yes. We get, we get a partial definition of what an adept is. What sets an adept apart from everybody else? As with all adepts, I found the image animate to a certain extent. Yeah, she's referring to the deck of dragons. When I gave it my full concentration, it felt as if a portal opened, created entirely from the other side of that card, from High Heart House Shadow itself. Well, now you're talking about the lie. What, oh, so she's getting also debriefed here about the whole hound situation. Yes, Lauren wants to know what happened with gear. Yeah, she said uh, the hound, it was an accident. It was something that she had triggered when she was reading her from the deck of dragons. Well, she actually plays the card of mystery. She says the shadow realm is new among the houses. Its full power is not yet expressed. People don't understand it yet. And she's playing upon Tayshrin's understanding of how these things work, but also his... His ignorance it, of that. Yeah, his lack of understanding of how, how Shadow specifically works. Because we all know that it was Hairlock that brought the Hound with him. We do, yes. Right. But she has to be able to spin a tale or create enough doubt that Tayshrin will accept the possibility. And then the question is, why did the Hound, if it was coming into where you were doing something, why did it show up outside your place? Exactly. And then she speculates, and I think this stuff is cool, where she said that she had warded her room during this time period, and the innermost of these is High Thier. And I don't know what that means, but Tayshirin was surprised that she could create High Thier wards. The Warren of Thier is the Warren of Light. That's her Warren, but she said High Thier, and I don't know what the difference is. And she said, such wards create a flux, a tide of power that surges and ebbs like a pulsing heart, one that is beating very fast. And she suspects that these wards were sufficient to bounce the hound away from her immediate area since it was in its transitional state, halfway between its realm and hers. And the hound could not fully express its powers, but once it had arrived, it could and did. And so that was her theory. Her lie. Yes, that she unwittingly summon the hound and instead of destroying her immediately it bounced off her wards Tayshrin said it's possible it's obvious he has his doubts but he recognizes that he doesn't fully understand how shadow and it is technically possible however talk to younger was watching her this entire time yeah well he he's observing everything and then uh, it's asked, well, how did you take out the hound and Tattersail says luck and she supposes again that Opon was the reason for this to happen. Then Dujek throws in, well, how can we get out of this? 
in Tattersail suggests that the way forward is in Darujistan. Talk is like looking at everybody. And then he starts looking at Tattersail and he realizes, and his eye itches, and he realizes that Tattersail has thrown us onto another topic of conversation so that we won't consider all the things that she said prior. <laughs> he yeah. knows she's lying. And he doesn't say anything. Brilliant on her part. She leads the conversation away from the topic that they're scrutinizing her on, basically insinuates other problems. Yeah, talk nails her. And, and like I said, and he was absolutely sca scratching his wound. She thinks she got away with it. Well, uh, with the exception of one person who is not giving her up, she has given, she has uh, gotten away with it. But then talk is asked to explain from the clause perspective mm -hmm. what was said that night. And he responds, <clears throat> in so far she knows it, the sorcerer speaks the truth. Yeah, he's just doing the same thing that Tattersail did. He's pushing, he's passing the buck on to somebody else, further distancing us from the original lie. And Tashrin said, accurate. He said, speculation is sound. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> Tashrin. Yes, but let's get to the point. Talk knew she was being deceptive, right? But he still covered for her. Why? He has a kinship with her because he's part of the second, as is she. He's lived with them. He's fought with them. He's suffered with them. And I, he connected with Tattersail. And he knows that Tattersail has saved their lives so many times. The bond of the army was stronger than the bond of the claw. What's their phrase that they have as far as the second is concerned? Always a fair trade. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of what that is. Exactly. You're, a lot of the time it's the sorcerer's cadre that is there defending the second army. Saves their bacon when all else fails. Yeah. And they get hit hard and they get hit often and they're always coming through. And this was him coming through for them. He's, as Yule said, paying it forward, paying them back. And like, what do, what's the indication that he made the, that move and it was the right move for him to make? His wound stops itching. Yeah, we, we talked about this last week when we first got together and we were talking about healing and et cetera. And how do you guys interpret that? It sounds like he has a minor talent to recognize something, whether it's uh, someone telling the truth or maybe when someone's actually lying, it's when his, his eye starts scratching. Maybe when something's being hidden from him, if I had to like really specify it. So you have the barrow where they're, they're talking about it, uh, Tool and Lorne, and they're kind of leaving him out of the conversation and his eye starts itching and he's like, oh, maybe I should, you know, maybe pay attention to this. And well, his eye starts itching as Tattersail's telling a false story. And I think his eye starts itching when Lorne's not telling truth about the shooting of the arrows, but I could be wrong about that part. I interpreted that to be more symbolic of the fact that he he chose the army over the claw as far as where his loyalties lie. That could be. But here, I, I think that's symbolic of not just that his eye is healing, but there's, a, there's an inner soul healing there. He's finding his right place, and he finally knows it, if that makes any sense. Oh, I hope that's not the case. Well, I don't know because I don't remember what happened. I don't know what happens in the in the future, but part of his soul healed by by doing a good deed. It does to me. It does. I like it. I don't think I can even elaborate upon that because I feel basically exactly the same. So he healed a little bit. That's pretty cool. Erickson has not been giving us more information about scars and all that kind of stuff lately, other than they exist on people. All the mention of healing and the stuff that Bellardin had said and the fourth chapter, I think. Bellardin said the scars without are the scars within. And Mallet said something about shock. You can't just heal the body because the yeah. body and the soul are linked. Do you think it was risky for talk to lie to somebody in the claw? Definitely. Why do you think Lauren was not able to discern that as a lie? He's gifted at lying. He had no incentive to lie. And yet it's like second nature that he saw through Tattersail's lie. She's emotionally compromised. That's possible. She yes. was. She was emotionally compromised. That's exactly what it was. All right. So that was a huge risk for talk. It was. And Tattersail knows that he did that, obviously. She also knows that he saved her life. Yeah. Okay, so one other thing. Did you guys uh, notice that Tattersail was unaware that Whiskey Jack had ever commanded the army? Yes, and I found that hard to believe. I, I couldn't. I did too. I could not reconcile that. How do you not know who's commanding your army? Well, how long had she been part of the Malazan? We don't know the exact number, but she's been there for a very long time. Let's talk about Tattersail at the end. Let's just remember to come back to this, okay? 
repaid for long service, Tattersail returns to her quarters, lucky to be alive. So in her absence, over the course of dinner, Hairlock has come and gone, and true to form, he's been cryptic, but he left a message for her with Perrin, something to do about, like, Lauren having a companion and blah, blah, I don't know. The dust walks around the adjunct and dirt shifts beneath her boots. The wind whispers of frost and fire. But she does seem to understand. Well, she just says, I think so, yeah. How do they get into their confrontation? Because this is a moment when Perrin and Tattersail kind of get into a fight. Well, they were having a normal conversation, and then Perrin stopped, and she turned around, and she saw that Perrin was struggling with something, as if fighting his very instinct. And then he comes clean with her. He says, I know something of the abjunct's mission. He said, I was to be her contact. Well, she freaked out right now because he came clean with her. Well, she thinks that he's there to kill the squad that she's involved in, right? He does not think that's true. How he calms her down is he starts talking about Ikko Khan. And he talks about what his original mission is about. And then ultimately they realize we're on the same trail and it's against, you know, to get sorry, basically. And she knew that as well. But Perrin knows everything. He says, come now, if you know of the massacre, it is hard to guess. That company was killed by shadow hounds. Which god? Well, Shadowthrone comes to mind. He says the adjunct believes Shadowthrone was involved, but the god that possessed the girl was the rope. So Perrin knew and the adjunct already know that Sari is possessed by the rope. And he also knew that the hounds were attached to Shadow Throne. My understanding, Perrin thinks his mission is to find and kill Sari. It says right here, I was the one she'd be able to find, so my being with the squad would bring her to the girl. So Lauren's job is to kill the girl. Perrin's job is to be there so Lauren can find him and thereby find Sari. And that connection has been severed by Opon. Right. So earlier you asked if there was any evidence that Opon was hiding Perrin. Do you think that's an answer? I think that Opon severed that connection for a reason because he knew. You don't think it could have just been a coincidence that they accidentally severed it? If death didn't do it, then Opon did it. Remember when they were saying uh, he has all that trauma, uh, Perrin? Yeah. And like, oh, I don't know how far back, you know, to cut in. Mallet refused. He didn't do anything. No, but he said somebody had already done it and didn't have a care. Opon did the surgery. They maybe were hiding their, their trail. Oh, uh, hold on. I didn't think about that. I don't know that it answers the question, though. I don't, well, to me, it doesn't answer the question to me. I'm, I'm okay with that, though. I don't mind having a little bit of mystery there. So that's why she's angry, but he does talk her through it. They compare notes. We find out lots and lots of stuff. Then Tattersail says that she's kind of all in with Whiskey Jack. Whatever he wants, that's what's going on. And then she thinks she needs to do a reading of the Deck of Dragons because she's made her decision. She's going to Darugistan, probably following Hairlock. Not mm -hmm. really sure, but if he goes, she probably should. And that's her decision. She's going to Darugistan. And she should do a reading from the Deck of Dragons. But does mm. she? No, she doesn't. They screw instead. Yeah, so mm. the last two times she refused to do a reading from the Deck of Dragons, what happened? People died or something? Yeah. What do you think is going to happen this time? Someone's going to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> so I pitched this earlier that Tattersail had this intentional thought to subvert Perrin's loyalties and recruit him. I think certainly she was trying to disarm him. But I think it went further than that. And it seems to me that Perrin is kind of like changing sides almost. It seems a little bit out of character for him to just so easily be persuaded to forego his responsibilities to Lorne. Maybe. It seems a little easy. I mean, before he'd even had a real conversation with Tattersail, he was already on board. Stretch. Well, maybe. It's obvious that he took pride and ownership of being in command of that squad whether or not it was kind of farcical and so that kind of betrayal is gnawing at him because getting sorry the person who killed like hundreds of soldiers in itko khan that's a goal worthy of his time but to kill whiskey jack and his squad that just does not sit well with him at all witnessed by no living soul lorne departs pale do you guys understand where she's going? Uh, she's not going to Darugistan? She's heading east. Yeah, Darugistan is south, but they have to go around the lake, so I don't, I don't know. I assume she's just not taking a lake. But yeah, she's got the mountains on her right, which are just to the east of Pale. 
it's pre-dawn. Let's get that straight. So it's dark out. There's nobody at the gate when she leaves. Well, Dujek has like cleared the her entire path from all possible guards and left the gate open so that nobody sees her leave. Right. And she's dressed like a mercenary. She's in disguise, essentially. She's joined by Tool basically right outside the gate and they travel together. Um, but he kind of startles her when she's on her horse and she's like, geez, please give me some notice. And so he turns to dust and then reappears a hundred yards further up the road. And he just stands there until she gets to him. And she's like, try and be a little less literal next time. Right. He already did the damage. It's kind of funny how he just does it again. I don't know if he's playing with her he, or he literally is like Spock and has no sense of humor. Dude, all I think is Spock when I hear, you know, do, see the things he does or the way he says things. When he's talking about how we kind of skipped over that, uh, where he talks about how his people went on this like war to kill other Talana Moss. It was Jaghut. They weren't killing Talana Moss. I think he did that right here was when he said that. Oh, is that in this part? When he introduced himself before, he's like, I'm the sixth son of the whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I was wedded as a warrior in yes. the Sixth Jagat War or something like that. Yes. Yeah, she shut him up then. She didn't want to hear it. She had an arm dislocated and she just barely survived. Right. She didn't want to hear it. Yeah. Right now, he's telling her his entire history. And it's coming as like just a nonstop truckload of revelation for her. They're like, this is stuff that people have speculated about, but nobody knows this stuff. And he's just casually telling her everything. But he, he name drops, he talks about all these people, and he talks about that, like, their high priest is the only guy that ever, like, and the more important, like, I don't know, I got a lot of stuff here, but the emperor, right, Kellenved, the old emperor, was a sorcerer. Who knew that? They never described that before. Nowhere does it ever describe him that way. And he's the one that woke up the Talani Mas. And they said, well, how were you woken up? Well, I was woken up before this guy and after that guy. <laughs> I mean, like he, that's... he can't talk about certain things. Well, that she's inquiring about the first throne, and he said that it was bound up somehow. And he said, upon the emperor's death, the Logros Talani Mas gathered mines, a rare thing that was done, that was last done before the diaspora, and a binding resulted. Adjunct, the answer to your question is within this binding. I cannot satisfy you. This holds for all Logros Talani Mas and for all Kron Talani Mas. And she says, who are the Kron? And he says, they are coming. And that kind of unnerves the adjunct a little bit because she'd never even heard of him before. And you guys want to go into the 28th Jagat War? Not a really important. I mean, the fact that there was one more war than anybody was aware of is... What I would like to say about it is this, is mm -hmm. when she questions him about it, we didn't even know when you guys were going to be back, you Talana Moss. Tool says that's because we didn't know if we were going to ever come back. You know, if we weren't going to survive, you know, the war that we were in. And it's kind of how he goes about having this conversation with her. And, you know, we're asking whether or not he's doing this as a rib or if he's just super Spock. I think they're so incredibly different from humans. He's 300,000 years old and they were alive before that. They're not even human. They're, they're proto-humans, right? I don't know what they are. Well, regardless, they're so incredibly different from humans. They clearly don't think like humans. Tool is a little bit different, and she was speculating why, and this may be a clue here. He says, I alone among my clan survived the 28th Jagat War. He, he's unbound now. He well, Unbound, yeah, in some way. More talkative. Well, no, he says that. He's unbound oh. because he's the last one. This is typical uh, Steven Erickson. He name drops like a ton of names you will probably never see again. But he does it all the time. It drives me bonkers. He will name drop a ton of things, and you will see these later, probably. We're going to be coming back to several of these names. Okay, fine. Some of these names come back. I don't know. He knows something. He had a psychic flash. As a rule, I pay. I try to underline... The first mention of anybody's name. You write in those books? Oh, yeah. Because if we are going to do all 10 of these books, I'm going to want to be able to come back and reference them. I'm like really lame. I keep a spreadsheet because I can't no, keep that's, track of No, that's this. probably even better. Probably better, but, but not how I, I do that. That's not how I work. <laughs> Dude, if I did not do that, there's no way I could remember this stuff because the names just pile up. The places pile up. The times pile up. Yeah. It's hard to keep track of it all. No, it is. So he mentions that the diaspora. Capital D. Capital D. 
as being symbolic. I have no idea what that means. Well, what does it mean? What does the word mean? It means to disperse, to spread. You lose your homeland and you go outward. You spread like seeds. And that's about to come to an end. And that's why the Kron, Talon, and Amas are coming back. The year of the 300th millennium approaches. What happens then? Adjunct the diaspora end. So the, what, the scattering ends? All right, food for thought for the future. We don't know what that means. It's a capital D, so it's something to pay attention to. And the pre-dawn chill, the great raven called Crone soars north towards another of her masters. So this is just like three short paragraphs. And it's Crone flying north. She's headed, we know, to Black Dog Forest. And she's exhausted, but she feels alive, more alive than ever, because there's a gathering of ascendance and magic and power. And she's on her way to meet Caladan Brood. She talks about having another master. Not Caladan Brood, though, right? Well, one's Anna Amanda Rake. Right. And she's heading to him, so I assume it's Caladan Brood. And he's a half-human. I think this is the first time he's referred to as half-human. Yes. Are you sure? We've seen that the Moranth are referred to as half-human, but I don't think Caladan Brood has ever been referred to as... I he, mean, I could be wrong. Well, no, he has historically specifically been called a human but here he's referred to as a half human warrior don't know what that means it's obviously different because i'm like well why was it a normal human still alive and hanging out with the tisty andy i don't know but here they clearly call him a half human which is starting mm -hmm. to make a little more sense maybe crone knows something that nobody else knows well she's flying towards her master and she's flying towards caladan brood so unless she has a Another person that she's meeting up with, which is possible. Who knows? Maybe he has a giant crow. Uh, yeah, a great crow. Yeah, maybe he has a great crow, hmm. and it's a male. Interesting. That's her master. Uh huh. That winds it down, though. I don't think we can really glean too much. It's just a tease, I think, for what's to come. And that winds down our chapter, which was long. It didn't feel like the previous eight chapters. I don't know. I think there's some exciting things here that we can talk about, but the chapter itself was not exciting. No, I agree with that. Okay. Compared to last chapter when we met Anna Amanda Rake and all that kind of stuff, the Talana Moss is not even close. I like this chapter a lot. I like this chapter too. I mean, I did. I liked it. But my point is, it's not this riveting, exciting read. It is a academic this read. This was an info dump. Like, if ever there was, was a chapter that was an info dump, this was a shotgun, fire hose, info dump. Yeah, there was. And it hurt to try to keep it all organized and straight. Like, it, it's going to be hell for your spreadsheet. Yes, this was a massive data dump. The point is, there was no building to a climax here. This was just story. No, this is a pass-through chapter. Yeah. It's a middle chapter in a book. This wasn't build up, it was clean up, or whatever you want to call it. Not even clean up, it was just a progression, right? Right, you're not even climbing the mountain yet. You're just like going on the like the flat trail before you even get to the mountain. Oh boy. Well, you know how uh, you take a linear, we were talking about the way this book is set up, it is really linear. It's just that when you get to another chapter, it might be a little bit before the last chapter where it started. You know what I mean? Like this one, uh, case in point. This we're one was the, confusing timeline we're in, we're in the Darugistan part of this book. And in the last chapter we saw, or two chapters ago, we saw construction going on. That and was a different we, book, man. Oh, yeah. We're on the mission now. We're on the third <laughs> book. <laughs> you see how hard this is going to be? But that's my point. The, the Jerusalem ended at, let's say, X, right? Well, this one is starting a few days before W, that we are now catching up to where that chapter ended if I could just try to describe it a different way is you've got multiple plot threads and they're all, they're all separate and they're all segmented, but they're all slowly independently moving towards Darugistan. And when you segment it like that, it's not linear, right? Cause you've got, you've got what's going on in pale. You've got what's going on in Darugistan. You've got what's going on with whiskey Jack. You've I mean, you've got what's going on with the uh, uh, Perrin and, and Lauren. My point is, but they're all going towards Darugistan, but they're, it's not linear. Right, because they're all separate threads of plot, and they he spreads them out. He just doesn't do it all at once. This, I guess, if you look at it like that, this was a little bit of a hard read, only because it was so segmented. So right. many threads. There were so many threads going on right here. Yeah, it wasn't just that we were following a character. Like for example, when we're dealing with Talk the Younger, when he's going to look for the adjunct, right? He's by himself. 
but we're introduced to the Rivi people. We're introduced to soon that, you know, he finds up with Lauren, there's Bar gas. There's like, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Tayshrin, finally. What, what's happening with the army? The malls on, modus operandi for taking over cities. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot going on here. The budding relationship between uh, Tattersail and Perrin and what it all means with Whiskey Jack and Talks Past. I mean, it, there's so much going on. It was, yes, okay, fine. It was hard to keep track of this, but, you know, whatever. We made it through. Let's, you know, move on. Rejoice. Give ourselves yes. a pat on the back. Okay, so what stuff do you think still deserves a little bit of attention? Because we skipped over quite a few things, to be honest. I don't even know where to begin because, like, I mean, it's all a laundry right. list. You, you got anything? Let me see if there's anything I think we forgot that I... I want to talk about Tattersail. I want to talk about Patron. And I wouldn't mind talking a little bit about talk. Well, what would you like to say about Tattersail? We know that she's one of the most powerful wizards there is. Left here with with the Malzans. And everybody is saying what a powerful wizard Tattersail is. Right. When she's being defended by Whiskey Jack to Fiddler, if I'm not mistaken saying how how wonderful she is everybody is uh, recognizing her um power so i just want to say that right off except for her yeah except for her she is a person who's tortured with her failings she uh is also tortured or maybe bound by uh some sort of so she has guilt and she also has uh loyalty or allegiance to uh the the bridge burners and that's kind of what's driving her right now she also is a person that will take on the guilt of <laughs> Lauren's parents being dead. <laughs> well, that was that was one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh-huh. that she has been she's been shown to us in this chapter in particular to be extremely compassionate. Like every person she encounters, she is described as being compassionate towards. She's compassionate to Lauren. She's compassionate to Perrin. She's compassionate to Whiskey Jack and the Bridge Burners. She's compassionate to Dujek, to Talk. Literally everybody she comes in contact with, except for Tashrin. Why do you think that Erickson is making a point of showing us repeatedly that she has this quality? Is it so that we then look upon other people with compassion also? He's trying to drive something home, but it either didn't succeed. Or it did exactly what it was supposed to do, which was to make me feel compassion towards Lorne, towards Talk, towards everybody that she encounters, except Tashrin. And I don't think we're supposed to like Tashrin, honest to God. Although there were things in here where we saw Tashrin behaving in a very human way, which made, I don't, hmm, it didn't make me like the guy any better, but it certainly made me feel like he was a more well-rounded character. Maybe even almost sympathy. I don't know. I don't feel sympathetic towards him. He's been pretty horrible, but he also behaved in a human way. Like he kind of came to Tattersail's defense when Lorne wanted to kill her. He's like, look, Dujek's right. You know, we were all part, I think it was his quote. He said something to the effect that, We're all part of the empire has its history and we are all within it. Yeah. But he might've been saving his own bacon there. He's like, if she's going to kill tatter sales, she might be coming after me. Uh, That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. (laughs) I don't mean to throw a wrench in that, but it's no uh, wrench. It's just, no, I'm just joking. Uh, No, he, he quite possibly was showing who knows. Maybe he is not actually the main foil in this story. Like we think. Well, do you remember when, like, kind of Lorne essentially relieved him of command? I mean, yeah, she gave him new orders. Yeah, I think his relief, I believe, was overwhelmingly sincere. It's funny to me because I didn't believe him at all. Really? No. Something, something about the way your mind works and my mind works were very different, right? We 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 already know this. As long as we've been friends, we already know this. Sure. But it's interesting to me because, like, I'm very sympathetic to Lorne and you are not. No. And I think she's ruthless. You're sympathetic to Tashrin and I am not. Well, yeah, it is interesting, by the way. I had never really thought of that. (laughs) It's funny. Well, maybe, and here's my thought here is because if you're ever put in a 
command and it's just you cannot stand it it's just like endless suffering until somebody relieves you that command nothing you want nothing except to be relieved of that command i can Mm. see that having been in that position it 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 resonates with me as legitimate i accepted this duty but i hate it and please take it away from me yeah sure i mean i think that's why people are they can identify and relate i think it was sincere because he's doing a bang-up job and he honestly doesn't have the capability to do a good job I don't think he cares about doing a good job. He just wanted to kill those wizards. All right. Well, maybe we'll answer this, but it's yes. That is actually a real epiphany. You resonate with Lauren for some reason, and I I sympathize with uh, Tayshorn for some reason. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny. Okay. So let's talk briefly about talk. Well, you you wanted to talk about Tayshorn a little bit also, right? I think we've covered enough of Tayshorn. I, I don't at I, this point I don't know that I can really add anything to him like I feel that he's a he's been humanized in this chapter and I appreciate that and that's really all that I think needs to be said from my mm-hmm. perspective okay talk the younger why do we like him well he is the narrator of a lot of this chapter so one well you know I mean obviously narrators can be people we don't like but we do we like this guy we, we spend like a lot of time with this guy and he has a lot of points of view when it comes to other characters and yeah he's super observant he's likable mainly i mean at first it's just because his father's likable it everybody likes him it seems or trusts him and they start off saying oh you know your father was quite quite the guy (laughs) he's like yeah i know he was and yet he rebelled against his father and went into the claw voluntarily and then his father went missing and they never got to reconcile. Yeah. I think there's a lot of truth there. That's... Do you think his father is dead? I'm going to say yes. But... I'm going to say yes too, because he's part of the old guard. And when Lauren said something about the Empress uh, regretted your father's death, he's like, he's just missing. And she's like, right. Got it. Did, did he ascend? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think we can talk about that stuff, honestly, just because we don't understand how it works yet. Mm-hmm. Well, I, th- I think the other part of his character, like you said, he may have been growing up living in his father's shadow when he rebelled and chose another career path to get out of that. But I didn't think you could join the claw. I thought they took you when you were a kid and that was just that. Who knows? 15 years of training and then they cut you loose and you're 20 years old and you're an assassin well maybe they saw something about making a claw out of the son of a brilliant commander i I don't know point is i think that he was raised by what appeared to be a good man and brilliant commander liked by everybody and liked by everybody and and so is talk and well so is talk but that's the thing is you that upbringing can't be undone it's still in there, no matter how much you try to erase it. And I think that's what you're seeing, is that that imprint from his father coming out now. And yes, I agree with you. I agree. And it's being brought out by Tattersail. It's being brought out by the Bridge Burners, the Second Army in general. And he's super observant. And he sees things that other people don't see. And maybe that's training. Maybe it is a gift. Inner sight. Yeah, that inner sight, which is intuition. It's several things. It's, it's, it, you can't really look up a definition for inner sight because it's not a word, right? Intuition, it's insight, instinct. Self-awareness, emotional intelligence. Like It's described in a lot of ways. So that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at, though. Do you think he already had this inner sight and then loss of the eye is like making it come out? Do you think it's actually there? Do you think it's just nonsense we didn't know talk before that's true and as long as we've known him we've had it but of course it was as long as we've known it he's lost his eye and there was that key thing in there that little key description oh some people say when you lose an eye it gives you inner sight i don't think that's a true i think erickson is specifically saying maybe maybe transition he just has real good intuition right you know what i mean I Uh, i do i'm just saying that you know the guy is skilled yeah so why, why do you like him? Oh, well, all right. How about this? Okay. I want you to be specific. I'm going to give you ex- specific things. He's on the Rivy Plain in the middle of nowhere. out In, in, the in open, a married territory. Uh, out in the open where he could be dead. <laughs> Supposed to be meeting someone. 
and he is in on all the information that's going on about Perrin having been killed, and now he's being nursed by Tattersail, and he just knows all this stuff that's going on. So he's a real a good lightning rod as far as a character. We get a lot of information from him. And then he is resigned in his fate. And he's like, you know what? I might go and I'm probably going to die going to meet up with Adric Lorne, but oh well. And then he wants to give her his horse. And then he rides with her. And he's funny with her. It, when he is uncomfortable and Dujek is cool with him, he pays it forward with Tattersail. And it's just all these things that are really good. And not only that, earlier in the book, Perrin has said how he sees talk as a person that he could actually have a friendship with and it's not somebody that he has had a relationship with like that in a long time and it's all of these things and i don't know just his awareness it's it's a good character and i think that's one of the reasons why we like him yeah you did you did a good job there if i if i could add just a, a little bit to my my no tickets. anyway <laughs> moving on no um i think either he's bred that way like from if he comes from a family of soldiers you're kind of bred with that mentality in in a way you're almost bred to be brave his father was brave he was bred to be a soldier and if you spend years in battle it either breaks you or you learn just not to worry about it does that make sense you become cavalier to death because you see it and risk it every single day it's normal it becomes normal and so i think there's that element to his mentality and it's magnified by his upbringing on top of that I think he's an affable guy. I agree that he's affable. He's everything that Yule described, but I also think that Erickson is putting him, like he's affable towards people that we like. The only person, possibly Lorne in your case, that he's affable with that we don't like. Dujek likes him. We love Dujek. Therefore, part of that's just through osmosis going to rub off on old talk. I don't think it's ever going to end, but... Everybody that I like in this book pretty much knows and likes talk. All right. Who else deserves any attention? Lorne. I like she, Lorne. She's badass, man. She was facing the four Bargas soldiers. Actually, aside from Lorne, there is the one guy for sure that was defending her, but she had two guys when she was on the hill. The Jakatakan? Those dudes were studs. Yeah. <laughs> that one guy got a lance threw his leg, pinned him in the ground, and he was still fighting off dudes so that he could protect Lorne. And that was really, really cool. It was. And they didn't live. <laughs> and she but didn't Lorne care. Did. But yeah, she didn't care. She cared about her horse. She didn't care about them. <laughs> I think that that part of her character, not caring about the humans, has to do with what was just talked about. That's normal. Like, soldiers die all the time. She's ballsy when Tool doesn't show up. And she's like, I was expecting you. <laughs> this guy, you just saw what he did to these fools. <laughs> and you're talking to them that way? <laughs> Dude, she was so close to death. That Bargast had both hands on his axe, raised above his head, ready to bring it down on her head, right? He was ready to kill her when Tool showed up. And two times she succumbed to Dujek also. And I think that was a cool. It shows her leadership also. She heard a better plan, and he also attacked her with reason about what her job was. And she changed the situation that they were, you know, she changed the plans, and then she didn't want to kill Lorne. So or, what you're saying I is mean, she Patterson. is capable of listening. And I think that's a really good thing, yeah. Yeah, it's a definitely great quality. I don't know. These are the things that I think, show us that she's not she look she's in a a very tough situation all the time being yeah. who she is and she can't be her own person i think since she is so high up she's used to things a certain way so even if dujek is very well respected she doesn't have to take anything he has to say at all it's a wise person that does, you know, and it, probably a, a good person. So when Perrin says he believed in the adjunct and that she wouldn't do me this way, he is questioning it at the end of the chapter, but he still thinks that also. I mean, he, he at least says it. She wouldn't do me. Do you think she would? Well, I think she was honest when she said she wanted to get to the answers of what happened in Itkokan. Yeah, no, I do too, but I also... And that's how she spurs Perrin on 
Yes, but I, I also think she'll end Whiskey Jack if the Emperor says end Whiskey Jack. Well, if that's the way it has to be, again, that's her very tough situation she has to be put in. Yeah, I mean, talking about between a rock and a hard place, though. I mean, right. she's literally answerable to the Empress. And Philip doesn't give two about her. No, nope, apparently. It's interesting. It's something we can think about and ponder, but I don't think it should be the subject of this podcast. She wants to kill Whiskey Jack. So she's therefore off, she's the bad guy. She's off my list. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, I hear you. Does there. she though? Does she? We'll see. It sounded like she's there to. I don't know. I, I maybe we know for sorry? sure what I know. One of the things that she's for sure after, and I'm good enough with that right now. It's complicated. People are complicated. Whatever. No big deal. Anybody else? Anything uh, else? We've talked about Perrin a lot, so I don't think he deserves any more attention. His part in this chapter was dull. Letting us know what the sword's name was. Mm, yeah, okay. And maybe, maybe giving disinformation, because we were talking about how Tattersail was like, I could never have done that, you know, those spells. I'd have died. Is she lying? Is Hairlock lying? <sighs> Did it happen? Everybody's you know, lying. That everybody's lying. That's, the, that's what it is. Everybody's, everybody's lying. Everybody's telling untruths. Like, seriously, this whole chapter was about deception. Like, from the yeah. beginning Ooh. to end. Yeah. It makes me look at this chapter differently, actually, because I didn't think about it as only deception. I mean, Tool, Tool was hiding and not... Even though he knew what was going on, he was still hiding. He was hiding the kind of things that he knew about the barrow and the trail. Um, Tak was the only one that wasn't hiding. No, Tak was hiding something later. He, he lies for Tattersail. Lauren was hiding what her mission was. What? From whom? From everybody. Well, Lauren's mission is not anybody's business. Exactly. It doesn't matter. That it's might be deception. true. Maybe she's the one the person thing. that isn't. <laughs> I don't know that she's being deceptive. All right. Tattersail is hiding. Definitely lying. Perrin. She's Perrin definitely lying. was being deceptive to her. Um, Harelock was being deceptive. He was being cagey <laughs> for sure. Well, well, okay. That's fine. We'll call it what you want. Dujek was not being totally honest. Um, With Tatrin. Tatrin was. Ooh. Tatrin was the only ones being honest. You know, Perrin might not have been. He never had a chance to lie to Tattersail. She had only woken up, and then he's like, oh, well, that's the reason why. He was pretty forthcoming, you're right. And he is a truth teller. That's his thing. Well, there was the one thing he said in there. He's like, not a lie, but more of a half-truth. He pointed, he had to point that out. Something that he said? Yeah, he's like, not a, it's like, not a lie per se, but more of a half-truth. Well, as, as again, it's probably a conflict of interest where he's not supposed to really yeah. reveal certain things. Yeah. My point is, it seems to me like this whole chapter it was, was a based lot, on yeah. deception. Yeah. There was a lot of that. I, at one point, I identified something that Tashrin said that I thought kind of was the theme and that had to do with the we are the empire idea. You know, it's like we got to see a lot of the cogs and the wheels in motion within the empire in this chapter. Like we saw how they recruit, we saw how they take over a city, we saw how how it affects the people that are in the army. All deception. All well, yeah, sure, all deception. But can we just you know move on to the theme? Yeah, I mean, like to me, that's what I identified kind of as a thematic idea throughout the chapter. Deceit is definitely very heavy in there, but I think that makes sense. But yeah, everybody was pretty dishonest. This seemed it was a dishonest chapter. It was dishonest. It was long too. Yes. And Lorne left? Yeah, Lorne left deception. in disguise. Yeah. Huh. Let's let's wind it up. Is that a, is it are we in agreement? There's nothing else really to talk about. We're just gonna have a private argument. Yeah. I really enjoyed everything we did today. I did too. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Sci-Fi and Fantasy Read Along. We are gonna get busy reading the next chapter so that we can bring you the next episode as soon as possible. See you later, folks. Come back for the next installment. It'll be better. <laughs> Maybe not. Who knows? You'll take your chances. Oh, there was one thing I wanted to do. I want to invite people to let us know what they think. I'm going to remind you guys to go ahead and look at the YouTube comments when you get a chance because a lot of people have. And <gasps> on that note, I would like to say thank you to Wolf227, Kyle Marshall, Simon Kelly, Matt Allegretti, and Mikey Judo, all who are new subscribers in the last month or so and who have left comments. So thank you very much for doing that. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you in the next one.